Good morning, traders, and welcome to the Bookmap Pro Trader webinar today, uh, Wednesday. And uh, uh, this is free and open to all. This is part of the, um, uh, you know, the Pro, Pro Trader series we do every quarter. Uh, today we have Raggy Horner. We've had her a couple times before. Futures trader, uh, options trader, also stocks. Raggy, is that correct? Yep. Yep. So a little bit, a little bit of everything. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, very happy to have her. Uh, a little bio here. Uh, uh, Raggy actually started trading at the age of 15 and a half. So this is actually incorrect. Um, while still in high school, uh, she has a passion for communicating and uh, the message of the markets, as well as teaching traders how to find an edge in currency and futures markets. Uh, she has um, uh, three books uh, published by Wiley and Sons, um, countless speaking events, uh, seminars, chief currency analyst, analyst at uh, IBFX, uh, which has been bought out by FXCM, uh, and uh, trips across the glo globe. Raggy shares uh, all she does and has learned at simplercurrencies.com. Uh, Is that, that's correct, right? Uh, uh, simpler Futures actually now, but we used to have a currency site, but Simpler Futures. If you just simpler go to Simpler Futures. Trading in the contact information, that's perfect. Okay, so here is her contact information. If you guys are interested in reaching out to her, I will be putting this periodically into the chat uh, so that you can uh, uh, very easily reach out to her. Um, I need to go over the risk disclosures here uh, and then I'll, um, we'll just turn it right over to Raggy. Uh, general disclosure, all bookmap limited materials, information and presentations are for educational purposes only and should not be considered specific investment advice nor recommendations. Live trading is in simulation demo paper trading mode and strictly for educational purposes. Live trading executed in simulation can cannot accurately represent realistic trading performances. Risk disclosure, trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. An investor could potentially lose all or more than the initial investment. Risk capital is money that can be lost without jeopardizing one's financial security nor lifestyle. Only risk capital should be used for trading and only those with sufficient risk capital should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Raggy, you're not going to go over any, any uh, automated trading strategies, are you? Mm -mm. No, I'm too much okay. of a control freak. <laughs> okay, uh, excellent. Otherwise, I would have to read out the, the uh, hypothetical oh, yeah. performance disclosure. I understand. Um, I'll turn it right over to you, to you Raggy. Uh, thank you very much for being here. No, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, gang. Uh, let me get my screen going here, which is always a little bit of a challenge, but let's see here. Uh, six, nope. Got to find which one of the nine is the one that you guys will see. Uh, let's see. I think that is it. Uh, I see. Hold on a minute. Um, no, I see Forex Factory there. Yeah, I'm going to start with the calendar. That's the one. Okay, great. That's it. Excellent. All right. So you got all I see is a big old picture in my head. So hopefully you guys can see. <laughs> There we go. All right. Uh, so let's get to it, gang. Um, so I'm going to kick off this session because what I really wanted to do, and again, big thanks to Bookmap. For those of you that aren't familiar with what I do with Bookmap, um, I actually purchased Bookmap years ago. And I, I guess it's been about two years now, maybe a little bit longer. And so uh, it became and a confirmation of levels that I knew were relevant, which is what we, what we do and what you guys know is important, which is why you've started to incorporate Bookmap into what you do, is you know that price alone only tells a quarter of the story. We know that price, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share these notes with you guys a little bit later, but there's, there's four factors, uh, and I'm gonna use this little note here on the side. So there's four factors for, for analysis that I believe in, um, price is what everyone uses, but then they stop there. So kudos to then take the next step, which to me is then volume. What is volume? It's conviction, it's participation, it's attention, it's commitment, right? So then we know we get to that volume. I also look at time, which is why we're looking at the economic calendar right now. And then finally, uh, volatility. And I'll show you how I measure that as well. So there's four factors for all analysis. I think it's even more intensely important when we're day trading. So we're gonna start this off with the, um, the calendar. Today, we just happen to be on day two of Humphrey Hawkins' testimony from Jerome Powell. It started 
I don't know if he's actually started yet. I probably should turn the television on. This is a time-based volatility event. Yes, most of what we need to know exists on the charts, but there is a good part of psychology that exists on the on basically the, so the sort of news or the, or the events uh, of the day that are going to be taking our attention. One of the things that a lot of folks talked about yesterday, if you watched yesterday's action, boy, was book map lit up like a Christmas tree. It was amazing. Um, in a lot of ways, yesterday would have been, and I don't know who was speaking yesterday, but I'm sure you guys saw it as book map users, which is as the market was selling off, you could see there was just nothing to catch it. No real size, no real bids. It was a hot knife through butter. You could visualize that so much better than someone, and let me just go to book map here. You could just visualize that so much better than someone who did not have the understanding of the support levels that the market could bounce from. And yesterday was all about Jerome Powell. So when the market started to sell off, we knew there's a volatility event. Uh, it was really interesting. Now, when the market midday started to find some support, you could see the bubbles. You could see the levels show that we were at a decision point. Not that we knew directionally that we were going to keep going lower or higher, but you knew there were decisions being made. And if you're a momentum trader, you saw when we started breaking through some key th thresholds. So one of the things you'll probably find that's a little unorthodox, although I don't know how everyone uses it clearly, but a little unorthodox is I do like to, from time to time, really scrunch my book map up. Um, I won't always be looking at it like this unless I really need to see a little bit more nuance. This view will come into play when I know I want to see more nuance in the in the action. Another thing that I like to do sometimes, and I don't have this overlaid because for our presentation here, I decided so we'd all be on the same page. I just set my book map back to default uh, charting so you guys could see just a default setting. And then if you wanted to add different layers, I think the default setting is a great place to start. I think a lot of times when people are new to book map, I know I did this. I started getting too granular about all the different levers and dials I could twist. And I think spend a good two weeks in that default view before you start adding on any of the amazing um, tweaks you can make within the settings. All right. So I figured I'd go back on here to this really good basic uh, level. Now, I don't live in the book map. Right. So I think a lot of times people get a little intimidated and they'll they'll sometimes lose out on what this could do to their trading because they just figure, well, I'll just look at book map. I won't look at anything else. And um, they're trying to retrain their eyes and their, and, their, and their process with a very different visual. So what I recommend to most folks <clears throat> is a combination. So I'm going to toggle between different platforms where we have that more traditional charting, which again, I think is very one dimensional. Book map is, is multi-dimensional. We talked about those multiple factors, price, volume, time, volatility. My price, my volume, my time, I can take care of with, with a look at book map. So what I'm going to do is show you uh, my charts, just some traditional charts. And there's nothing super fancy here, um, gang. What I'm doing is I'm looking at some one-minute candlesticks. I have a, a color-coded candle that I call grab, completely free. That's a free, you can find that on any number of platforms and it colors the candles according to where we are in relation to the 34 exponential moving average on the high the the close and the low so right now i can see we have a little bit of bearishness on the s p but i also know that we're near this low right in here from 937 and this area here is a volatility projected low now that's just historical volatility. So I hope what you're seeing is, wait a minute, Rog, you're telling me you've got some lows you're coming up into. And then that's when I'm going to start to look at what book map is telling me because my chart can't tell me where that size is waiting. So another aspect to this is we all have, you know, sort of more traditional, you know, just traditional ways of looking at candlesticks. Um, so you can look at a traditional candlestick interpretation, uh, maybe patterns, support, resistance. Uh, you can you know, overbought, oversold. 
even our indicators. I will confirm. I don't want to use that. I don't. I think a lot of times people think they have to completely abandon um, processes that they were starting to get some uh, positive results from, and they just abandoned it because now they're on bookmap. And, and that may not be everybody. What I highly recommend is if you had a process you liked and levels that you knew just need a little bit of tweaking, start with that. Start with what I think is probably one of the most powerful conformational tools out there, which is the book map, start with identifying things that you're probably already comfortable with identifying. Maybe use a stochastic, maybe use an MACD for momentum, maybe use some moving average or moving average crosses, maybe you're using time-based clearing ranges or initial balance uh, breaches, things like that. Pretty, pretty commonplace in the day trading world. What's not commonplace though, is then being able to say, well, if I think the area between about 38.53 and a half and 38.47, 38.48 could be a layer of support, I don't know what's waiting there when I look at a traditional chart. Bam, that's when I'll switch gears. And as we close in on those levels, I want to see if in real time, I'm starting to get the participation at those levels that would give me confidence to be a fade buyer. All right. I know I've just thrown a lot at you in about mm, seven, eight minutes here. So let me take a look at any of the questions that you guys might have. And I'll just sort of keep notes. I and so what I'm trying to tell you is I confirm all of that with the uh, book map view of this is the way I look at it. Participation. What are we seeing on book map? We're not seeing in other places. Participation, size. Again. Most people stop at price. You're now taking two factors, three if you're looking at time, and you're looking at those three factors. Price without volume to me is an incomplete picture. And you guys know, I don't care how much volume really occurred at a certain time. What are we able to see? And I'm telling you, after three decades, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You're looking at volume based on price. And I know that's rudimentary for some of you and for others, you're thinking, oh, that's that's the needle mover. That's the difference maker. So yes, what I'm doing is I don't care how much volume happened between 943 and 944, not really. What I care is how much volume was sitting at 3855? How much volume is sitting at 3865 if I'm gonna get a breakout? So let's say, let me get my drawing tool on the, I think this should, allow you guys to see a little bit more of what I'd like to see for a setup. So I've got this layer in here, right? And this might additionally be where I could see an MACD uh, breakout, right? Well, this is what I can't see on a price chart, not in the same way as I'm seeing at Bookmap. So I know that if I'm going to get some sort of breakout, and it looks like it would be potentially through the point of control, so you're already familiar with things like points of control where the most volume has occurred between a certain segment of time. That white line there represents the most volume I've seen since 930. And you can put that on your book map. So I get a little bit of redundancy there. Notice how as we're breaking through it, do you see how I'm looking at A, that layer, B, what are the, what are the, what are our size, what is size telling us now? These are tiny, tiny participation bubbles are they this is what i want to see i want to see and i don't i'm not surprised to see size built here because this is where the market stopped before so what i'll say is are we responding with the right type of bubble at that level i like to see the big bubble at that level volume attention conviction commitment and so that's that breakout level that i was talking about so we go back on over here what i'd like to see is either a positive macd if you want another kind of confirmation um by the way the reality of if you're you know you watch this live with me or whether you're catching this on replay the reality is it's 16 minutes after 10 and we're waiting for powell day two of humphrey hawkins testimony so i think technicals are uh really not necessarily ideal i don't consider book map a technical and i don't hold technical in like this irreverence. Um, it, I hold it in high regard, but a lot of people are just blind to technicals and they're not thinking about price and volume. So I like tools that measure volume. That's why this kind of confirmation 
is so important to me. And MACD is just arithmetic around open, high, low, close. Most indicators that traders use before they start to understand the importance of volume is just you know number crunching the high, low, close, which is fine. We're then taking that step that most traders do not, and we're confirming that with size. So I hope that makes sense. Let me um, let me tackle a few questions here because I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. I'm live trading. Uh, again, I'm not here to tell you what to do, how to do it. Um, Bruce gave you guys all the um, disclaimers. Uh, just look at what I think, look at how I'm walking you guys through it. And I love that we're doing this after the clearing range. So this is when I get to work on the day. After the clearing range means after the first 30 minutes after the bell. So I like to see the market. Uh, and, and what else am I able to see between 9.30 and 10 on Bookmap? One of the reasons I like to keep this view until I'm really willing and ready to get to work is I wanna see what the ranges were between 9.30 and 10. Where was the market able to run up to and run into resistance? Where was the market able to run down to and, and, and find support? That's your clearing range. That will be, and you can see it overhead. I've already taken one breach buy. What does that mean? I have this overhead resistance. I'm looking for the market to take it out to the upside. What's the next level that I'm gonna be looking at if we get a clearing range breach? You can see it right in front of you. Let me highlight it here, right here. Oh, let me make that a little bit bigger or a different color. That's kind of hard to see. Um, I'll just make it in white. Right here and right here. And I'll make that a little bit bigger. Sorry about that, gang. Let's get these drawing tools visible. Bam, right? Bam, said the lady. That is what I'm looking for. So I already have levels that I'm, I'm waiting for. I know, and this is a little bit different, I'm not letting Bookmap or even Price tell me what to do. I know what I want to do because volume has told me, well, these are interesting breach levels. That's my pitch. That's my pitch. Now I'm just waiting for my pitch. And when it starts to get closer and closer, what do I want to see again? That's when you'll see me do this. And I want to see the way that we get up there and the type of bubbles we get when we do. All right. So that's, that's going to give you my game plan. I'm already long. I want a clearing range breach now. I want to see this market take out a, uh, the clearing range high, because if we're going to grind higher on the fuel of Jerome Powell, who yesterday, by the way, said, hey, the U.S. economy is nowhere near the 2% inflation target, which means um, we're probably not going to see the Federal Reserve rush to a tightening cycle or a taper, which is something that stocks or stonks are mortified of. If you wonder why this market sold off, it's because Fed fund futures started to, to insinuate that maybe a September, December hike was possible. Bond market, the long bond, 30 years started to say, look, the Fed's losing control of the uh, longer end of the yield curve. And, and Powell basically came in and said, oh, bond market, oh, Fed funds, you guys forget I've got the biggest bazooka of all. I've got monetary policy and I can print for as much as um, the global economic system will let me because the US dollar is the reserve currency. That's the macro backdrop. That's also the drama playing out in front of us on television now. So we're gonna have a very tricky day because every little thing that the Federal Reserve says, every question that's given to him is gonna make the market start to respond to, oh, is this dovish, is this hawkish, is this bullish for stocks, is it not? Okay, so that's a little backdrop to what we're dealing with right now. This is not a normal day in any way. So again, until I'm at a level that I wanna do something uh, with. And by the way, if you're a super active day trader, all my cards on the table, you're probably not going to like the way I trade. And that's okay. Um, it, it's totally fine. Uh, everyone's got a different approach. If you like, if you're one of those people that's going to have 20, 30 round trips before noon, you're, you're going to, you're going to find what I do slower than molasses. It's like watching paint dry. I like to pick a spot, find that pitch and then get in. So if I have four to six trades by 11.30 noon Eastern, that's a pretty full day for me. So realize the way that I'm setting up trades does have a certain pace and it's on the slower end. Uh, I will also say that if you keep your book map zoomed in, I think you're gonna tend to wanna over trade. 
So, so be cautious about that. If you like scalps, then fantastic. Nothing's going to give you more insight. I'm just not a scalper, so I think it's my responsibility to let you know, gosh, if, if I want to learn how to scalp, uh, probably not the person I want to listen to, right? So um, let's see, first question. Hey there, Dan. Uh, you know, people always ask me about dark pools and things like that. I'll, I'll tell you what, I've read a lot of books uh, about it. I don't find, and look, I traded through the systems uh, volume of, of the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and then of course, you know, the algos and the high frequency and everything else. I have not found that what I'm sharing with you now works any differently or works any less than before. I mean, are dark pools a factor? Uh, of course, I'm not going to tell you they're not, but I don't find, because all I can tell you is what I have found through the interpretation of different volume tools. And I've used a lot of them, Bookmap's the one that runs on my computer. Um, like I said, I was, a, I was a customer, a paying customer at that long before Bruce and I got to talking. All right. So what I need to know is I can trust my tool and, and I get it, right? Do I think that I trust what I'm seeing volume wise any less. I don't because I haven't seen my results um, diminish with what I'm doing. Remember, I'm already identifying price based levels and then I'm asking Bookmap to show me relative to volume that's occurred before whether or not I'm seeing a response at that level. And for what I needed to confirm and give me confidence in, you know, whether or not the market's going to exhaust at that level or whether the market has the ability to bust through that level or whether the market's going to find support at a certain level. I'm really looking, and, and here's a really easy way to do it. See how we're gaining some speed? I want to see those bigger bubbles into, like I mentioned, that's that clearing range high area. This is what I need to see. Do you see that? And, and dark pools haven't changed that for me, right? That's what I need to see. I'm not surprised that that's where it's happening. I know that's my clearing range high, right? See this right here? Uh, let me point this out. This is the clearing range high right there. So that candle, which most people see as a very one-dimensional candle, we are seeing the response at that level. That's the difference. And you'll see I'll toggle back and forth. So you don't need to abandon everything else you're doing, but I just want to say that as much as I love my charting and most of the tools that are running on my screen are tools that I've created. But we have to acknowledge the shortcoming of these tools. Now, I will say this area up here could be some resistance because historical volatility tells me we could struggle. But if I want to see that we're going to break through this, it's even more important that I continue to see these larger bubbles. Larger bubbles are a relative conversation, relative to what came before. So I hope that makes sense. And I, and I do anticipate the market to struggle just a little bit here. One, because I've got a historical volatility range in play. That's what this is in here. This is a calculation that I created many years ago using historical volatility that looks at the typical price movement for a six month look back. So um, that is there overhead. But if we're gonna if we're gonna survive this, I need to get above 3880 and I need to keep looking at those bubbles to see if I've got the size. Is it a bigger battering ram? Because that's what I'm gonna need. That's what, but nothing here is telling me that I'm sort of, look at the size of the bubbles. Do I feel that as a buyer or a bull that I don't have company? That's another thing. You know, let's, let's use some layman's terms. I'm not gonna get into a lot of volume profile, market profile conversation. Let's just say that, you know, in some ways, <laughs> Mike makes right. Size does matter in this context. So if I start to see, relatively speaking, see how the bubbles are getting a little bit smaller and we're coming up to that resistance level and I'm sitting in this area, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of losing, like, you know, I'm losing some of that size that I need. It doesn't mean that I'm going to short. It just means that it might take a little bit more time to attract more buyers. I can't see the buyers getting attracted here, can I? On my sort of one dimensional or, or wonderful charting, I use this all the time, but I can't see that, that psychology. This is a graph of psychology, even sociology, right? Understanding mob psychology, understanding the, the behavior of groups. That's what we're doing when we're trading, right, gang? Book map is what, for me, is what is, is so important to understand that inside that sort of uh, one dimensional one minute candle or however many candles are stacking up, 
you can see the battle raging here. And there's still a lot of size, so it tells me there's a lot of uh, opinion. It's an important level. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't caught off guard because again, we had this zone already highlighted. We have this overhead resistance, again, already right there. And then again, notice I'm not abandoning things that I've used for decades. I'm, I'm not supplanting anything, I'm supplementing. So I'm still long, but what does this allow me to do? I'm not gonna, most traders get very twitchy here. What does bookmap allowing me to do? I can see the battle raging. No one's winning, no one's losing. In fact, I still think the, the, the bulls are holding, got plenty of support. It brings me a lot of calm. I may not sound calm. I get very excited when I trade. I, I love I love doing this. You know, if, if someone would have told young Ragi, hey, you're gonna you're gonna sit around and use these cutting edge tools from your from your home and 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 trade the markets, you know, wouldn't have believed them, wouldn't have believed it. But yeah, I get very excited. But book map actually gives me a lot of calm. So I know there's gonna be a battle raging here. I'm not gonna get shaken out for no reason, but I could put in a trailing stop if that's something that I want to do. All right, so um, do, ha, have dark pools affected the way in which I interpret and use this tool? Not in any way, not in any way. Uh, I know there's always been activity that I'm not gonna see till the end of the day. Before dark pools, it was block trades. You know, so you might, and kudos for the question, pre-seeding this dark pool, which is, I know, a different animal, but back, but back in the 90s, it was, it was a block trade. All of a sudden, this big block trade would go off that didn't go off at that moment, but it's something that's already transpired. And, you know, it made you wonder, am I really seeing size? And yet, you know, back in the 90s, when I was trading level two and, um, you know, looking at the, the, the ECNs and the market makers and so forth, I still, I still could get the job done because we're still following a certain amount of flow and opinion, okay, and size. So thank you for the question. Um, and Dan, thank you. I, I hope that my talking through this is A, more interesting than my throwing this on a PowerPoint and B, I want you guys to see this happen live. You know, let me let me leave this on, on the book map for a minute because we're still battling in this area. Isn't this interesting that pretty much that same volatility zone, and this is the other reason I love book map. It's confirmed in so many ways where I know this volatility zone sitting overhead should have size, but I don't know, right? It just is an arithmetic calculation based on time of day and typical price movement going back six months. I don't know what's happening here, but you see this red zone is lining up with this confidence. Now I know, all right, that's a level that the market's got to contend with. And here we are just bouncing back and forth. So um, it just, again, gives me calm, gives me confidence. Uh, what else do we have here? Mm, am I currently am I currently long? So it was that level that I was showing you earlier, Thomas. Yeah, when we broke through that first level, and then and then I don't know that I'm going to buy again if we break out through 38.80. But you know what I'm tempted to do is perhaps look at 38.74 with a tight stop. If we're gonna and and remember today is not a typical day. I don't I want to keep reminding everybody of that because we have the second day of testimony from Jerome Powell. Usually what I tell my traders on a day but Jerome Powell is gonna be at the mic, it's a caution day. And I'll be very conservative about my trades. But another thing I wanna keep in mind is I don't wanna short Kapow. That's what I call him, Kapow. Oh, <laughs> I don't wanna short him. Now you saw, we all saw what happened yesterday. So what I'll probably have to do is, what I could do from my previous buy is if we start to break down through here, as you can see, it's happening right now. If we start to build some size and break down to that level, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the plug on the trade. I've already scaled out once, and then I'll just take out. And this is this is gonna represent a trailing stop. That's it. What can I do now? I'll wait for the next setup. I'll just wait for the next setup. So I'm gonna go back to my price charts. My next setup, and let me see. I'm, I'm focused on the ES, but the truth of the matter is, I probably would be better off looking at Let's see. NQ is interesting. Crudel's kind of interesting. Russell's kind of interesting. YM's kind of interesting. All right, let's go take a look at NQ. The NASDAQ has really uh, been hit hard these last few days. So let's take a look at the NAS. See how the NAS is pulling back down to this area here around 13,050? 
let's pull up the NQ here. Look at that. Oh, darn it. I should have switched on over earlier. 13,050. Bottom of that volatility range, 21 exponential moving average, 13 exponential. So I've got some support in this area. And again, I, I in golly, we had that nice layer right there, a little bit of size building. A lot of folks like using bookmap for momentum. Let's 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 flip the script here for a second. When the market starts to drop, oftentimes you'll see spaces between the bubbles and the bubbles get very small. That's normal. But a lot of times people ask me, well, Rob, even before we start getting those nice book map support levels, how are you interpreting that the market's kind of putting on the brakes, right back to the size of the bubbles? If I think the market is moving lower, we're getting red bubbles, red bubbles, red bubbles, and all of a sudden the red bubbles start getting larger at a pullback level, I'm going to interpret that as not more breakdown because the market's already been moving lower, right? If we get a large bubble at a resistance level, that to me could be fatigue. As we're falling, if the bubbles are relatively small to in relation to the bubble that we get at say a 13,050 major psychological level, or in this case, I've got a 21 EMA, I've got the lower end of my volatility range. If the bubble gets large after a series of small ones, that's one to keep an eye on. So again, it's not just the layers to keep an eye on in terms of those nice um, highlighted, these little fire levels, right? Not just these little fire levels that I'm looking at. It's also the size of the bubble as we get there. So again, smaller bubbles leading to a larger bubble is a completely different conversation. So this, the, the, the size in that regard is, is very important. All right. Um, all right, let's go back to the, and if you notice, I do, I do look at currencies on this as well. I will look at currencies. I'm an avid currency trader. I don't have any setup on the on the Aussie uh, so far. I am interested in trading crude oil at some point, perhaps, but um, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll keep from moving through too many markets. Let me uh, let me grab another question here. So I just got out, Thomas. I'm I'm looking. I'm willing to get back in, but I just did get out of that ES, and I'd be totally fine to get back in. Now you might say, Rob, you know. Look, the market bounced from there, uh, and that's fine. I'll just wait for another setup, and that is going to be now 38.75, 38.75 to approximately 38.73 and a half. So that's what's. So what I'll typically do is I'll write that down. I'll write down those levels, and that's what I have interest in. And then I will. So once we get down to that level, well. I'll look at whether or not that's a level that makes sense. Right now, it probably doesn't. Okay, it probably doesn't. But we know that this is an ever-evolving picture. So uh, potentially, uh, once we get down there, if I start to see the small, 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 large bubble, and then I start to have uh, the, that level lit up, it's starting to light up now a little bit earlier than I thought it would. See, it's 76. I wanted 75 to 73 and a half, but that's okay. If that's where it's going to light up, that might be where that size is waiting so i might have to tweak my entry a little bit you see that so i have a level based on price in this area and if i need to step out in front of that this is going to tell me okay maybe 75 and a half 75 and three quarters might be a better fine tuning of that of that level but i want to see those larger dots when we get there showing me that the market's responding to what i'm seeing both from the perspective of support and moving averages and volatility and again multiple factors that volume is kicking in there too. Okay, so you'll notice I'm going back and forth between price and and um, my my indicators and volume. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, hey there, John. It seems to me that NQ deep liquidity levels act as magnets, whereas ES operates more as support and resistance. You know, I, I love that you mentioned the word magnets, John, because I I believe I I call it gravitational pull. We're on the same exact page. I don't know that I notice it any differently on ES than NQ, but I will tell you the relationship between ES and NQ is an interesting one where I call ES the dog and NQ the dog walker. When you think about the weighting of individual stocks and sectors in the ES, it's really a second rate NQ. Um, in fact, tech is the heaviest weighted sector in all three of the 
major indices, Dow, NAS, of course, and S&P. So I tend to find the NES sort of follows the NQ around. And um, more often than not, yes, the YM can have influence on the ES, but that's mostly when we're seeing financials at work and healthcare. But generally speaking, if tech is leading the charge, then we would know that through watching NQ or XLK, XLY, XLC. When NQ is leading the charge, uh, unless financials and healthcare are just you know, getting crushed, ES is gonna move with NQ. So um, that's the way I look at it. I, I do think that volume can act like a magnet because as one of my mentors told me many, many years ago, um, the market moves in the direction of the most stops. Well, we can see that right here, right? The market moves in the direction of the most stops. Now, that's where this sort of insidious in, in interpretation of, oh, stops, they're hunting stops. I think a lot of people look at the market as this thing that's out to get them. And, and I remind everybody, the market doesn't even know we're there. It's like a surfer atop of the ocean. Ocean doesn't care. It's going to keep doing what it does. So the way I look at this is, um, the market's job is not to be demolishing your account or even to reward you. The market's job is simply to fill orders. And it's going to, it's like a heat seeking missile. It's going to move in the direction of those orders. That's typically what happens. And, and so, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's that magnetic action that I think you've observed very correctly. I think that's a brilliant way to look at it. Most people don't sort of think about size as being magnets. Um, I think it's that way in most markets, but I think the ES-NQ relationship is unique because NQ typically moves. So oh, I'm getting pretty close to that zone I told you I want to be a buyer at, but notice I'm not getting a lot of help. Uh, I can't say that the bubbles are giving me a lot of confidence. Remember I told you in this area, we might look at a buy. So I'm looking now to see if we can start to increase some size. I want to see, relatively speaking, a larger bubble. I'm not getting a lot of help though. Right? Where's 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 that volume stacked up for me? It's kind of a thin level here. It's kind of a thin level. So you might say, well, Rog, would you buy? If I see a thin level, but the size is there and I already have a level that I think could be valid on, on my price chart, I'll take a smaller position. I'll take a smaller position. I don't have to pass on it altogether, but I could take a smaller position. I think this would justify a small long. All right, and that's that level we were talking about before coming down towards uh, 75 and three quarters, 74, all right? Uh, do I use book map for equities? Uh, I do, I'm, I'm sticking with futures because that's what I trade in the morning the most. Um, and I, and, I, and I've, I've been mostly focusing on futures in the morning between 9.30 and 11.30. So uh, yes, it, it works, it actually works in some ways even better in the broader indices because remember indices are just collections of stocks, right? Indices are just collections of stocks. And so if I get a better idea granularly at, um, if I get a better idea of what's happening at a more granular level, meaning the heavily weighted stocks, if the ES is moving, what do I wanna see moving? XLF, JP Morgan, Apple, Microsoft, right? So, to me, it's a great supplement and additional opportunities. And sometimes you're gonna see better clarity at the sector or individual stock level than you will at the index level. So that, so yes, and that's the way I look at it. And it works actually really, really well. In fact, if there's a part of Bookmap that I think ends up being neglected, and I can't speak on behalf of you know all the other presenters, but I know for me, like it's a shame that I haven't done a stock presentation yet because it it really does work phenomenally well. Well, yeah, absolutely. I like I said, I use it for currencies too when I trade, say, the 6A or the 6J. Gold works great. Um, crude works great. Mm. Next up is so yes, very very confident, big fan of that. I just don't do a lot for whatever reason in the morning with during these presentations, mostly because I'm you know up to my eyeballs and e S N Q Y M R T Y. Uh, uh, Daniel asks, wouldn't some of those bubbles possibly stop runs of the uh, shorts? Yeah, I don't, again, I just look at it as filling orders. Who's getting benefited by that? Who's being, um, 
So somebody else's stopper and somebody else's fill. So to your point, yes, it could be. It could be a stop run, but stop runs uh, of shorts to me, I mean, there's there are long squeezes too. As much as there's a short squeeze, there are long squeezes too. So what is one person's exit is another person's fill. I try to keep that in mind, but yes, absolutely, sure. And, and again, if they're running stops down to a level of support, we had, we had called out that level of support as potentially this technical base level. Remember we talked about all this around 38, 75 and three quarters down to 30, uh, 73 and three quarters, 74. So we knew that was a level, what, five, four or five minutes before. And then what am I doing? I pick the level out here and then I'm just looking for the confirmation. Not the best confirmation here though, not the best. And again, Jerome Powell's testifying doesn't surprise me. It's gonna affect the way the markets are gonna respond. So not a clean, clean trading day because you know, day two of Humphrey Hawkins testimony is a big deal. But um, so yes, of, of course, of course. But remember, if, if someone's um, short and they're buying back, someone else might just be getting long. So for one person that that buy is not a net long, but for somebody else it is. But yeah, I like where your head's at. I, and you're exactly right. But what do I want to get opportunistic at? For me, I like when those markets pull back. Love that. Um, we talked about one situation where Bookmap helped us through a um, resistance level here. We talked about Bookmap helping us through what was not a strong support level, but it was a support level nonetheless. And again, look at the size of the bubbles relative to what preceded it as we get down to the support. That's really important. And I'm not worrying about it until I get to my price level. I think if you're trying to use Bookmap and you're a brand new user, don't Initially, I think the longer you look at this, you'll be able to use Bookmap as a standalone more and more and more. But I think in the very beginning, if you have levels based on more traditional price-based analysis or moving averages or what have you, maybe there's an indicator that you like, uh, let that show you where the price is. I walked you guys through that, right? Moving average, volatility, told me that zone, and then let Bookmap cons confirm it. So that's, a, a, I think, a really powerful way to do it. Um, and I actually don't necessarily, now I know we can change the, now I'm using the traditional dot. Now the other thing you guys can do, which would be helpful, like I said in the beginning, and I'm not trying to make this for beginners only, but I think it's a good place to start if you're brand new with Bookmap, because a lot of things that um, sadden me is if someone starts off with Bookmap, starts to overcomplicate the use of it, starts to overtrade, uh, they don't see the results they want to see, and suddenly they think, well, Bookmap doesn't work, and that's just not true. Um, volume works, right? It's not a matter of, well, book map doesn't work. No, it's a matter of, am I using what it's telling me at the right time um, and in the right way? So just my just my approach to it. So you'll see, I'll kind of toggle back and forth. Keep it simple at first. Like I said, the first couple of weeks, just study the difference, the relative size of the different bubbles. Study where you would typically make a move sans volume and then add the volume and say, oh, this is what Bookmap is telling me at this level that I would typically want to do something at. Is it fine tuning the level for you? Is it negating the level for you? Is it better confirming the level for you? Okay. Um, next is currencies. You know, I don't have a trade on currencies right now. Uh, if I did, I'd be happy to show it to you. Uh, let's see here. Um, you know what? Seventy. If you want to keep an eye on one, um, Peter, seventy nine ten on the six A. Seventy nine ten on the six A. Keep an eye on that. So what have I done? I've I basically plucked out the volume weighted average price since 9.30. I've got a, I've got a, um, I've got a 7 a.m. and a, a 9.30 a.m. anchored volume weighted average price. I'm sitting right in front of the major psychological level. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to get long around that level. And then I will see what kind of action I get. And I already see those levels between 14 and 10 are lit up. Now I need to see the response when we get down there. So I know they're there. I know they're there from a price-based technical indicator type perspective. I know they're there from a volume perspective. And now I wanna see if and when we pull back, 
relatively speaking, do I see the size kick in? And that could be a level to watch. All right. They move slower though. And, and you know, of course, ES and NQ are moving pretty swiftly today because of uh, because of power. Yeah. Okay. So hang on, gang. Let me. Reggie, actually, I have some questions for the currencies as well. Um, <clears throat> we um, cover them every now and then in in the uh, in the webinars, uh, daily webinars we have. But um, since you're the expert with the with the currencies here uh, and have traded them for so many years, uh, the, you know the liquidity is very different uh, in the uh, currency futures. Uh, you see a lot of like kind of hedging or um, you know a lot of arbitraging. Uh, every other price level, you'll see the, the just kind of like this here, like you know, you'll see liquidity at at, at every other price level. But they're always pulling, um, you know, once it gets up to those levels. Uh, sometimes they stay in the book, and those are those are really good confirmations. But uh, most of the time, it kind of comes up to those levels, hacks around a little bit, and goes back down to the other level. They pull. Um, I, just wondering if uh, you have any insights on um, trading uh, currency futures with Bookmap. So I'll do the same thing where, you know, I, for example, if we get down to 14, I wouldn't be surprised if they pull the 14, but 79.14, I wouldn't be surprised, I would be more surprised if they pull 79.10. Um, and, and, and if they did pull 79.10, I wouldn't be surprised they, if they appear at 79.06. So um, I'll look at levels they were at, I'll look at levels they're at right now, and I'll look at the proximity to a major psychological level, a volume weighted average price level, a level that I would consider important before I then go confirm that on Bookmap. So yeah, I mean Forex is a, is a little bit different a beast, but um, I guess because what I tend to do, and you know, until you said something, I probably didn't, I probably wasn't that conscious of it. See, that level gets my attention as much as this level, and I hope that kind of makes sense, gang. So if this and, and, and this level gets my attention too, but not as much because it's really the 79 double zero that I think the closer we get to, we're gonna start to build interest at. But what I'll do is I'll look at where they were interested before, um, before where I think they might pull shenanigans. I agree with you, although we've had support previously here. So one really good way to, to look at a level like this where there's some doubt is, you know, did they step in before and if they did and their size, they might defend that. They might defend that. Um, yeah, 06 would get my attention. So does that help? Does that sort of make sense? I don't know that I was ever sort of consciously competent of what my eyes and brain were doing, but that's how I would interpret this particular chart. No, that, that's 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 excellent. I, I would agree with you. I mean, it looks like the guy at, at 10 is, is you know, likely gonna stay in there. And, the, and you can even see the large lot tracker um, in the order book there is showing probably about, uh, I don't know, 60 to 70 or, or one is one individual actor. In, in fact, it's the same guy. Um, you can see him down at 7902 hmm. uh, and he kind of moved back and forth between that and 06 and then he pulled from 06 and then put it to 10. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, look at this from here. Yep. You can definitely see when we get a hole here. Yeah, he shows up there. Yeah, yeah, and then he then he moved it to ten, and it seems seems to like uh, just call it quits for now, um, or at least he's holding at ten, um, and um, uh, yeah, like likely the same player, um, but uh, and and a larger player at that for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I would I would agree with you on that. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, that's the way I look at. So I I think one of the mistakes I used to make early on is I wouldn't look back. So a lot of times, if there's nothing here, a lot of folks will just tune that out. I think it's really important to look back at what has transcribed, uh, you know, so um, transpired. So well, as I'm interpreting this, you're right. If if this were to disappear, it's amazing how often they'll end up here. So that I think the previous levels are levels that I sort of mentally make note of. It's like hopscotch with these guys sometimes which I think is kind of what you were saying, although you said it a whole lot more intelligently than I did. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you, I mean, I've been looking at this program for years, <laughs> but um, it, it's just um, the currencies definitely, they're, they're different. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I, I would just um, wondered about your insights on the, on the currency futures because of uh, your, your background and experience. The closer I am to a double zero or a 50, I feel a whole lot more confident. Um, it's at 32 that I'm not as happy. It's at, you know, 
65 that I'm not as, I want to see those, those double zeros and those fifties are very powerful. I have found in, in currency trading Forex specifically, you know, so if, if the 6A is a reflection of what's happening in the Australian dollar versus US dollar. So a lot of times I'll look at what's happening there as well, but the same psychological levels to me um, apply, you know, for sure, for sure. Okay. So that's, that's what I found. If I can gravitate towards those psychological levels, I have a whole lot more confidence that while they may step off, I'm probably within, you know, a handful of ticks of where they want to build their position. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you can see now that guy did exactly what you said from 10, dropped it back down to 06. Yeah, it's just, it's just I, I, I remember uh, looking at it like hopscotch. You know, so he's going to jump from here to here, and you can kind of see that in the past. You were you pointed this out that that this so when when the from here to here that's one little jump. Did it again here, and then now he's doing it here. Yeah, I I, I hear you. I think you pointed it out. So I'm just I'm just I'm just surfing your wave there, my friend. I, I think you <laughs> nailed it. Um. Well, you know, another another thing like um, you covered this in the last webinar you did, which was it was just excellent and. Uh, uh, I, I think it's so important. Probably, I mean, in in you know my personal opinion, um, uh, such an important element, but also probably one of the best kind of indicators that you can use is uh, correlation to the U.S. dollar or uh, you, you know um, maybe bonds or something like this. But um, your correlations with the with the dollar, uh, euro dollar last time, were, and and the yen as well were were just excellent. Uh, do you use that in your trading, um, uh, like like today? You know, I realize it's been a long time since I think I presented Bruce. So since then, wow. So since then, and it's all going to depend on central bank activity. Right now in the reflation macroeconomic stage that we're in right now, I typically am very bearish dollars. So I'm going to be bullish things like copper. I'm going to be bullish things like crude. I mean, we're in a reflation trade. Grains have been in fuego on long meats. Um, so in many ways, I think we're just seeing the sort of move into commodities i think we're still at the pretty not maybe at the base of that move higher but we're still on the climb in commodities and and in that reflation trade the 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 inverse relationship between that dollar weakness and the commodities moving higher that reflation trade uh gets me interpreting what's happening in currencies differently since most currencies are traded against the dollar so we're never trading australian dollar futures gang we're always trading aussie versus something we're never just trading euro it's euro versus something so the versus something is usually the dollar and I'm very bearish dollars. So I'm very bullish Aussie because of the reflation trade and commodity currencies are gonna benefit from that. So if I'm bullish stocks and if I'm bullish uh, metals, you know, remember Australia is a huge exporter of, of aluminum and iron ore. They're, I believe the third largest digger of gold so it's hard to want to bet against these calm dolls. And then you've got Canada. Energies have been flying. So again, Canada exports lumber, which I think is right now the relative outperformer amongst all commodities. So I, you know, I'm bullish Canadian dollar. So I'm still very bearish US dollar. I'm bullish those particular currencies. So I think since we spoke last, we're, we're now in this reflation environment. And, and so I'm quite bearish the greenback. OK, excellent. Very cool. Uh, let me tackle a few more questions here before our, our time is up. Um, do I place a stop when I enter trades? If so, so um, Thomas, so you can use the support levels just below. Uh, well, so for, for example, I'm gonna go back to the chart here. Just like I pinpointed a level that I thought would be support in the ES, a lot of that was based on the 21 exponential moving average and the 34 EMA high, close, low. So typically my stop will be on the other side of that red moving average, which is the 34 EMA on the uh, low. But actually just below that, I would probably consider a volume weighted average price re-entry. I don't mind taking small paper cuts um, along the way. And, and I, I think one thing that I omitted from our conversation, because I mean, there's just so much brain dumping I can do in an hour, but I have an overall bullish directional bias. I'm not interested in shorts. You know, I don't I don't believe that fading Powell yesterday was the was the move. Uh, I think the better path of least resistance is to wait for those nice divots 
in the market, those nice pullbacks, wait for your pitch, wait for those lower lows and buy from there. Even though we bought uh, initially a breakout high and then took a small um, pullback buy, um, I want to only be a buyer. So if you notice, I never talked about short. I, I stuck only with long positions. So in that most recent conversation we had, where that's 75 and three quarters down to 73 zone, um, my, my stock would be below the bottom of that buy zone. You know, it might be a half a point, it might be a quarter point, but my stock would generally be below that. And, and I think that, um, I, it's, I always hesitate to say this, but again, in transparency, I'm not a big fan of placing my stop in the market. I, want, I like to place alerts. I like to be aware of what's happening, especially if I'm day trading. Um, you know, set it and forget it. Day trading doesn't work. You've got to monitor it to a certain degree. I'm only trading day trading for two hours every morning. So I don't think that's a, a very t high tasking thing uh, to have 120 minutes of focus between my price charts and my book map is not overly demanding. But um, I think that I like to put my limit orders for entries and limit orders for exits. So I love conditional orders, but I will not place the stop. I will see the way in which we get there. Am I getting small book map bubbles? Is it just a wick? Uh, you know, what's happening today, you know, in the case of Powell. So there's things I like to assess, which means I also have a slightly higher risk tolerance, but um, that may not be applicable and, and, and right for everybody, but I, I will typically place my stop below the validity of the buy zone. But when I say place my stop, it's not physically in the market. It's an alert typically, or I'm watching it, or I've, you know, I've written it down on my, on my pad. And, and that's another thing, even though I'm tracking book map and all that stuff, write, you know, be an active note taker in the market, be an active, you know, take notes, take screenshots, uh, I, I believe in, and being very active. You know, I see some day traders sort of kick back and be active in your, maybe not your trading, but in your, in your, your, you know, taking in everything the market's telling you. Take lots of notes, take lots of screenshots. And taking a screenshot on Bookmap is ridiculously simple. And that function is so easy, I, I recommend doing it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, um, actually, if I, if I can <laughs> override for just a, a second here, um, you, you mentioned something very curious. So um, you're, the way that you are trading, um, uh, your trading style is you are looking at the bigger picture uh, and then you're day trading, uh, and you're you're also in you know taking larger, longer term positions. But then your day trading is always within one direction. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. All right. So if you see something set up, a, a nice setup uh, going, you know, the opposite direction, uh, you you would not take that. So even see all these levels to the upside. In my mind, those are all potential targets for longs. I will not short this market. Now, are there days that I'll wake up and say, okay, I'm in a bearish directional bias? Yes, but that happens very seldom because if I if I step back and I look at the overall direction of this market, the lower probability side of the market to me are the shorts. Even, you know, you can look at on Monday. I had two I had three trades set up, two that I took. They were all buys. And and S&P was one of them. Nice winner. Yesterday, I think late afternoon, folks who waited for sort of the post Powell capitulation great buy. So, you know, a lot of times people say, well, won't you get stopped out on down days? Absolutely. That's a function of it. But I think folks who are going both ways through all of this missed out on the commitment you get when you're playing with the larger trends. So my daily time frame has a huge influence on the way in which I'm looking for setups. And I've been bullish only since November 3. I have not put a single day trade short on since the 3rd of November. Wow, that's uh, excellent. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right, anything else I can cover for you guys? I don't want to keep you. I know that a lot of you are actively in the market as I am, but was there were there any questions that I did not address? Uh, oh, the iceberg. Tim, um, yeah, I do use the iceberg. Like I said, what I did, and Bruce set me up with the iceberg last, what was it, September or August of last year? I can't remember, Bruce. You set me up with that. So, So, Tim, what I did, and I'm a fan of it for sure. But what I decided to do, for better or for worse, and to make sure that everybody felt like this is something that's accessible and usable on day one, is I went with the default settings, right? I didn't want to throw too many bells and whistles on here to intimidate or discourage folks who are just getting started. So I kind of had in my mind, 
a really good act live discussion using using sort of the baseline of where you could start and build with bookmap because i know a lot of you have access to very sophisticated bookmap um, users i've seen some of the past webinars so i thought you know what let me let me speak to someone who's been with bookmap for less than a month or three months and is still trying to find their footing and then can grow from there because i think if you can get this foundation down yes you add something like the iceberg i mean you're, you're going to feel like you've got x-ray vision i totally agree okay like um people are asking about recordings yes they'll be up on our youtube channel um uh, later today in a few hours in fact uh, look for it. It'll be in the ProTrader webinars, uh, re, you know, uh, playlist there. Uh, and uh, um, people are asking uh, you, Raggy, about your uh, if you have a trading room, etc. So I've been putting your contact information in the chat. Uh, you have, you should have basically everything in there. But maybe you wanted to mention something uh, about that, Raggy. Sure, sure. Um, so you can find all my services at Simpler Trading. Um, I'm in the Simpler Futures room. And then some of you that might, so I like some longer term setups. I'm in something called Sector Secret, which is more of my options uh, trading longer term daily time frame. Uh, by the way, Bookmap is, if I'm, if some folks ask Rob, would you still look at Bookmap when you're putting in a longer term trade in Apple? Yeah, if I'm trying to figure out where I want to liquidate or put a bid in on, a, on an option, I think every trader would be benefited from the type of, a, of, of acute, entry order execution that a day trader has to have but when you have that ability even to apply that to longer term time frames you're just going to be better at order entry and if there's any skill that i find is lacking in folks who are not avid watchers of volume and respecting of size their order entry is awful and i mean that not to put anybody down but it just it's something so lacking in our industry where people just get so consumed with the charts and, and the price, and they forget that order entry has a lot to do with size and understanding size. So I think even for your longer term setups, Bookmap's just gonna make you a better order um, you know, executor of your trade. So um, but so those are the two services, uh, Simpler Futures, Sector Secrets Mastery, they're all available at simplertrading.com. And then I do have a free newsletter, it's at accountdowntrader.com. So if you are interested in some of the conversations we had about copper and crude oil, the macro discussion, some of my discussions about trends, that's free. You can just go check that out at countdowntrader.com. So hope all that helps and gives you somewhere to, to pivot from as we wind as we wind down today. Okay, excellent. So um, there were still some other questions in here. Um, and um, uh, guys, I think we're gonna have to have to leave it uh, at that. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Um, I, I can uh, I can copy them and send them on to Raggy uh, if if you like uh, Raggy. Uh, okay, and, great. And um, uh, and plus you guys have the, her contact information. Oh uh, yeah, so. I saw that the after hours Thomas. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just scroll down to after hours. Not often, and if I do, it's after 8 p.m. Um, and then some of the other questions. I think gang, if you watch the replay, as far as bubble sizes, relative size, I think you'll see that in the um, in the replay and then do i care what the color of the bubble is at that level actually i don't i'm not as concerned about i'm i'm more concerned i think in the beginning focus on the size of the bubble and then transition into those um bruce what's the name of those pie chart bubbles because that's what i usually have on what is that one called that, that's just total volume okay so so um, i mean basically we it, it it's a pie chart because so many transactions happen so quickly or in a small area that we have to give kind of an overall so i don't recommend starting there i'll just say focus on the size and then you can like i said go into that pie chart looking bubble to get a feel for the the buys and sells at you know buys versus sellers at that level but um, this was designed to be really a good basic look if you never went beyond this I really be believe you'd be fine but if you can build on top of this you're just going to understand size and behavior at a, at a much better level so I, I hope at least I accomplished that and I really appreciate the questions um, as, as far as some of the questions about the other platform that I was using yeah I'm not going to get into that here again I just want to stay focused on the book map but yes I do use thinkorswim charts trade station charts as well as trading view Okay. Um, well, uh, let's uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Raggy. It is, it's always always a pleasure having you. It's been it's been a while. We're very very happy that uh, we had you back. 
uh, and uh, and look forward to it, um, uh, you know, an another time as well. You bet. You so, bet. Okay. Thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks, we'll catch man. up another time. Take care. Be good to each other.